We are now going to discuss the second part of dive medicine and physiology, ascent. In order to do so, we need to return to Boyle's Law, which established that there's a relationship between volume of a gas and the pressure exerted on it, and that relationship is inversely proportional. So when we descend, as the pressure increases, the volume of air in any vessel decreases. If we flip that equation, as we ascend, as the pressure decreases, the volume will increase. Looking at the following slide shows us how that can become a problem. Let's say for a moment that we took a full breath at 30 meters, and then we held our breath and moved up to 20 meters. The volume of air in our lungs would expand to four-thirds the initial volume. If we then moved up to 10 meters, it would expand to twice the amount of volume, and at sea level would be four times the amount of volume that we initially took in at 30 meters. This will eventually become a problem as the lungs cannot hold that amount of volume or pressure resulting in a pneumothorax. If we look at the four spaces where we contain air during a dive activity, we see that we have the mask, the GI tract, the lungs, and the sinuses or middle ear. The mask is great because that airspace will self-equalize. Any increase in volume will simply escape out the sides of the mask. During ascent, the GI tract might be affected minimally due to increased volume of any gas that was created in the intestinal tract during the dive. The sinuses will normally release any increased volume of air through the sinus tracts, which will then be exhaled during normal exhalation. However, a phenomenon known as reverse squeeze can occur when those sinus tracts become edematous and closed during the dive. This edema might occur from very forceful equalization during descent. Reverse squeeze will present itself as pain, pressure, and in severe cases, epistaxis or sinusitis. The solution to this is to equalize as you're going up and to do a very slow ascent. The middle ear is also susceptible to the reverse squeeze phenomenon. Normally, air in the middle ear will escape through the eustachian tube during ascent. But in a situation of mucus or fluid accumulation that might occur during a very forceful descent equalization, or sometimes a diver will know that they have to have perfect equalization during descent and will take decongestants to overcome a common cold. If those decongestants wear off during the dive and the eustachian tube becomes edematous, reverse squeeze will occur. Reverse squeeze in this situation presents with pain, hemotympanum, and in some situations, a ruptured tympanic membrane. The solution is similar to the sinus reverse squeeze in which forceful equalization might overcome this pressure and ultimately slow ascent is necessary. This slide shows a representation of what happens with middle ear reverse barotrauma. At depth and proper equalization, the pressure in the middle ear and the outer ear are equal. Normally, as you ascend and the pressure inside the middle ear increases because of the increase in volume, that extra air volume will escape through the eustachian tube. But if the eustachian tube is blocked, the air will build up and continue to expand during ascent. When this pressure reaches a certain point, it will actually rupture the tympanic membrane. The lungs will undergo a similar situation called overexpansion, which will result most commonly in a pneumothorax. As we showed previously with the balloons, if the balloon size and volume continues to increase during ascent, Eventually, it will reach a point where the lungs can no longer hold that air and will pop. The solution is simple. You don't hold your breath as you ascend, but rather continuously breathe in and out or constantly exhale to allow the lung volumes to adjust. This slide represents what would happen on the right side if you exhaled as you ascend. Decompression illness is composed of two entities, decompression sickness, which we spoke about briefly in the prior presentation, and arterial gas embolism. Decompression sickness occurs during a rapid ascent in which the dissolved nitrogen forms gas bubbles. 
Those bubbles then enter the bloodstream, and dependent on where they enter the bloodstream, a diver will develop certain symptoms. They might have a generalized fatigue, but also if the bubbles come out of solution near the joints, a diver can experience severe bony pain, referred to as the bends. If it's near the spine, a diver might experience paralysis or urinary retention. In the extremities, they might experience paresthesias. If it's in the heart or lungs, there could be pulmonary edema or complete cardiovascular collapse. The brain would result in paralysis, confusion, or dizziness. The skin might present with a blotchy rash, and in severe situations, unconsciousness or death. Generally, decompression sickness presents 15 minutes to 12 hours after a rapid ascent event, but can occur later. Arterial gas embolism occurs in this pathway presented below. During rapid ascent, if the diver is breath holding, that'll result in a pneumothorax. That pneumothorax will allow nitrogen bubbles to directly enter the arterial circulation, which can then go to either the brain or the cardiopulmonary system. As you can see, the symptoms and signs of an arterial gas embolism mirror the symptoms and signs of decompression sickness. Decompression illness is all about prevention. Using a slow ascent and continuous breathing, or more specifically not breath holding while ascending. Dive computers are frequently utilized to ensure a safe dive. They use dive tables that have been created by human trial and error along with the time at specific depths to create a dive profile. That dive profile will help ensure a diver does not ascend too rapidly or stay at deep depths too long. Staying at extreme depths for a prolonged period of time not only exposes divers to nitrogen narcosis, but also enables an unsafe buildup of nitrogen that can't be offloaded before one runs out of oxygen or air in their tank. It should also be noted that diving and flying can be a dangerous combination. The general safety interval is 12 to 24 hours, meaning that after you've completed your dive, you should not fly for 12 or 24 hours. This is because the average pressurized airplane is only pressurized to 8,000 feet, and so you would very dramatically change the atmospheres at which the diver is subjected to. The general rule is 12 hours after a single dive, or 18 to 24 hours after multiple dives, but in general it is best if a diver errs on the side of caution to prevent any problems with decompression illness. On a historical note, decompression sickness is sometimes referred to as caissons disease. A caisson is a large underwater chamber in which the bottom is open and water is kept out by means of air pressure. This is how they built the foundation of the Brooklyn Bridge. Many workers died or had temporary or permanent medical problems related to this.